Would you like it on you or right here? Well, um, I don't know. On the blackboard, I think it's fine. All right. Yeah. Here, why don't I close the can? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I give out candies to people who ask questions. It's important to ask questions. And um, in fact, I've been criticized by various students quite legitimately for um, following the text of the book I wrote too closely. Um, the only thing I can say is that when I wrote the book, I put the concepts in the best order that I thought I could put them in, and so obviously I want to stay close to that order. Well, um, anyway, by asking questions, you'll um, divert me from the from the literal text here. Now, I plan to talk about some basic aspects of group theory today, but. Um, as I said in the ad for the course, um, the students uh, can pick what topics uh, we focus on. And um, I listed a whole smorgasbord of topics. And um, do, you, do you already have some in mind that you'd like me to concentrate on or to skip? Yeah. I want to learn tensors, general relativity stuff. Tensors. Okay, that's a, that's, a, that's a good choice because there's so much new stuff. Colored microwave background radiation and uh, more recently the gravitation, the detection of gravitational waves. Uh, the machine oh, actually, I have a question. And also the you. Uh, Okay, right. now I have to confess that although I've been interested in artificial intelligence for some time, and I've read a little bit about it, um, and I've never worked in the field, so I'd like to postpone that for a little while, but I do intend to, to, to do that, and I think you're quite right, it is interesting. Um, uh, I actually know a little bit about the biology, you know, um, which could be relevant at some point, um, because after all, our brains um, are the best artificial intelligence. Um, um, did anybody else have a suggestion or a preference as to topics? Yeah. Cosmology, and it was on that list, right? Cosmology? Yeah, okay. Um, oops, sorry. Um, yeah, well, we're going to do that in the GR part. Um, it, okay. So, um, does anybody want me to, uh, are, are, is there any strong sentiment that we should skip group theory? Are we going to do, are you, so you're going to be talking more about continuous symmetry and continuous groups, right? For group theory, you mean? Yeah. I mean, I learned a lot about discrete groups and basic group theory in undergrad and in abstract algebra. Yeah, I was going to focus almost entirely on continuous groups. I would like, I'd like to keep that in there. So you want to hear about continuous groups? Okay. I suppose I have both of you. I've got to learn to pitch better. <laughs> All right, well, the important thing, though, is to ask questions. Um, partly, the, what, one advantage of this grading scheme is um, that people should be more relaxed than in a course where you might be worried about grades. And so, um, you don't want to give us a quotation from that movie, do you? Um, when it's appropriate, I guess I will. He's memorized this screenplay of one of the best uh, movies ever, Casablanca. <laughs> All right, so let me start out by just um, 
telling you what a group is. And um, the group is um, a set of objects or uh, and an operation. And um, the key thing is that if F is in the group and G is in the group, then the product FG is in the group. That's called closure. And that's, the, that's one of the really key properties. Um, the second is that if, if F times, that F times GH should be the same as FG times H. This is called associativity. The third is that there should be an identity element, E. So EG is GE. In other words, this is the, the identity element. And four, there should be an inverse. So G inverse G is equal to G G inverse, and that's the identity. That's the identity. So these are the four properties of a group. Okay. Now, the, uh, a, a really important observation from the point of view of physics and this is why it is that groups are important, is that every that sets of transformations naturally form a group, and in, and in particular, a set of transformations that leaves something invariant forms a group. Okay. So, and the reason for that is that um, if you have a transformation, let's suppose T uh, that after T something is left invariant, after T prime something is left invariant, then uh, after the after you do both transformations. Uh, the thing is still left invariant. So let me first of all say that typically we, we call multiplication is the operation. So a group has elements and then an operation. The operation is called multiplication. Um, and in in the case of transformations, it just means that you do one transformation after the other. Um, and so what you can see here is that if, let's do these properties first and then come back to closure. If um, you do one transformation and then another transformation, and then you do the third transformation. Well, that just means you do one, then the other, then the third. And that's the same thing as doing, as doing the first one, the second one, and then the third one. So associativity is automatic, and identity act uh, is automatic because you can have a transformation that doesn't do anything. And then, if you have a transformation, you naturally have, you can undo the transformation, in, for most transformations. And um, so you naturally have an inverse. Now, the one that's non-trivial is closure. But closure is automatic if the transformations leave something invariant. Because then, if t leaves it invariant, and t prime also leaves it invariant, then you, could, you just leave it invariant twice, and it certainly is invariant. So that's why um, 
transformations that leave something invariant naturally form a group. And so let me now give you some examples of um, such uh, groups. Um, first of all, suppose that's the origin. Then transformations that leave the distance of any point from the origin invariant. Those are rotations or reflections. And I drew this as three-dimensional space, but of course it could be n-dimensional space. And um, in that case, the group uh, is O-N. If you it, it, that's if you have both rotations and reflections. And in particular, what's invariant is x1 squared plus x2 squared plus dot 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 plus xn squared. Well, this is equal to x1 prime squared plus x2 prime squared plus, plus xn prime squared. That's why it's called uh, ON. So the distance from the origin is the sum of the squares of the coordinates. And um, if you have a transformation that turns x1 dot 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 xn into x1 prime dot 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 xn prime, and the sum of the squares is the same, but the distance from the origin is the same. The group that does this is called ON. Um, there's another group that, uh, that, that consists just of the rotations, and if we just have the rotations, then the group is called SON. It turns out that for such uh, matrices that do that, well, let me, uh, let me just say here, if we have x1 prime, x2 prime, xn prime equal to some matrix, and then x1 dot 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 xn, this would be then an n by n matrix, and um, uh, the condition that, suppose we call that matrix um, M, then M transpose M, X M transpose X, X transpose, this would be X prime transpose X prime, and if these are equal always, then the condition is M transpose M equals I. And this defines the, um, the uh, orthogonal group in N dimensions. But, um, and the subgroup SON for rotations is the one such that the determinant of N should be one. Okay. Was that too fast or too? Okay. So O in this case is a, a abbreviation for the word orthogonal. Orthogonal, yes. And what would S then be? Okay. S is special, I think. Okay. And um, it's just used all the time if the determinant of all the matrices is one. That's what S means. The notation is very simple. Or at least this notation is very simple. Eh? Okay. So that's an example. The thing forms a group. Well, they're transformations because the x's are transformed into the x primes. But we get closure because we're leaving something invariant, namely the distance from the origin. Um, a slightly different set of transformations is the transformations that does the same thing, but now these are complex numbers. So z prime squared plus zn prime squared is equal to z1 squared plus, well, absolute value, sorry.
So these are, are, are transformations that map n complex numbers into another set of complex numbers such that the sum of the absolute value squares of the complex numbers are the same. And these are called, the group, these are the group of unitary transformations. Um, here what you would have would be Z1 prime, Zn prime, and some matrix Z1, Zn, if you call that matrix U, then um, this is equal to Z transpose U adjoint U Z. U adjoint here is um, U transpose complex conjugate. Um, and there's a, another group, which is a subgroup of this, which is the, the set of n by n unitary matrices that have determinant one, that's called SU. These are most of the famous, so to speak, compact groups. Um, uh, compact means that basically it Basically, that if you look at the at the matrices, the elements of the matrix don't become arbitrarily large. That's one way of thinking about compact. So I've always been a little bit confused. I know there's a formal some sort of relation between S O N and S U N. S O N and S U N. Yeah, because like okay. the way it relates to rotations, but I've never seen anyone really make it formal. They just sort of said, "Oh, there's a relation between the two, and then it kept going. Okay, that might be too long a question. All right, frankly, I do not know. Let's see. Is it? Are you keeping track of where I'm? Yeah. Again. Okay. Sorry. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um. So. I'm not aware, or I don't know about a general relation between SON and SUN. What is true is that um, in particular cases, one can relate various, uh, it is various SUs to various SU2. SOs. I think, I think SO3 and SU2 Oh, well, yeah. they're both, I they both, they, 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 right, right. That's, that's an example. It, SO3 is the rotation group of, <coughs> on three objects. SU2 is unitary transformations on two complex objects. And the, the SU2 can be thought of as, um, or rather, SO3 is the adjoint representation of SU2. Um, now, I haven't brought up representations yet, but group theory can get very, very technical. And I'm going to avoid the technical aspects of it. Um, it can get, um, uh, in fact, it can, it can also get extremely difficult. But um, I'm, I'm going to be focusing uh, on the Lie algebra approach. And in the Lie algebra approach, things stay. They can also get complicated, but they don't get the appallingly complicated. OK, I left out one, there's one other set of um, compact groups. And um, these are all the symplectic groups. And instead of being uh, O n, it's always an even number. And this is new, so it's not in it's, it's not in the, the book. I mean, I talk about symplectic groups a little bit, but um, I've learned something new about them lately, so I'll tell you about it. The symplectic groups um, are actually very important in physics, and their importance is 
largely been overlooked. And what they what they do, well, let's let's look at the simplest symplectic groups. S U Q N R. R means that these are real matrices. These are matrices that are two n by two n square matrices. And what do they do? They preserve the commutation relations the commutation relations of quantum mechanics. In other words, here, why don't we turn the uh, thing around like that. Uh, in other words, let us Commutation relation for QI, QJ is zero. PI and PJ are zero. And QI, PJ is I, H bar, delta IJ. Now, um, some of you, especially undergraduates, I should explain what this bracket is. Um, in particular, what this actually means is QI times QJ minus QJ QI. That's what bracket comes to. Bracket, comma, bracket, something, comma, something else, bracket means. It means that. And um, in quantum mechanics, the Q's conventionally are the coordinate operators, and the P's are the momentum operators. So these are coordinates. And these are momentum. Yeah. Do you know this? Does this extend to the rotational commutators? just linear. Right. I'm thinking of them in terms of the basic canonical commutation relations of Q and P. Um, I, I've thought about, but not seriously thought about your question. Um, it, it, so in other words, the rotation, the, so what he's referring to is the commutation relations of, for example, angular momentum. IJK run from 1 to 3, epsilon IJK, totally anti-symmetric, epsilon 1, 2, 3 is unity. So we, we're getting a little off track here. H-bar, of course, is a small amount of action. Oh, say, let us say energy times time. It's the, it sets the scale of when classical physics uh, no longer uh, is reliable and where you have to take into account quantum mechanical effects. Processes of order h bar or a few h bar or smaller than uh, quantum mechanical things happen, can happen and uh, you need to take into account quantum mechanics. And so suppose what we have is, suppose we, suppose we take We make a vector here out of Q1, Q2, Qn, P1, P2, Pn. By the way, did, how many people have had quantum mechanics? Okay, some people haven't. All right. Um, quantum mechanics is a is a is an amusing and interesting subject. Um, for the purposes of, well, of this course, um, the, all right, the, the, let, me, let, me, let me give you just some of the basics of quantum mechanics. You know, so a lightning one minute course in quantum mechanics. Um, the basic observation uh, was made by Heisenberg a long time ago, around 1925, and it was that 
you can't simultaneously measure position and momentum to arbitrary accuracy. There's an essential incompatibility in measurements of position and momentum. Simultaneous measurements of the position and momentum of the same object is an inherent uh, uh, problem. And um, it's basically that the uncertainty in, in position times the uncertainty in momentum has to be greater than or equal to something like h bar over, let me say h bar over 2, I don't remember, maybe h bar over 4, but um, it's, it's, you're going with 2? Right. It's, it's All right, great. Thing. Um, and uh, the, the, the reason for this is, is you can just imagine that if you want to measure the position of something, you have to know where it is. And in order to know where it is, the object that you're using as a measurement apparatus, you have to know where that is. But the only way you can know where that is is to have it in a laboratory screwed to the floor so you actually know where it is. On the other hand, if you want to measure the momentum of something, well, you let it collide with something very light, and then you, the, whose mass you know, and then you see how that how how fast that object uh, recoils from the collision. That's how you measure the momentum of something. So you see that the object that you use to measure the momentum of something has to be uh, small and light and um, easily moved, well then you're never going to be quite sure where it is. So the, op the measurement apparatus for position has to be screwed to the floor, the measurement apparatus for momentum has to be uh, almost unattached to anything, and so there's an intrinsic uh, incompatibility there. Anyway, um, this, hi David. You can come in and sit down if you want. Uh, oh, okay, thanks. But um, you can also go make a coffee somewhere. No, it's fine. I'll sit down. Okay, so the basic um, so let's see. Uh, I I need to. That, that's the one of the basic ideas of quantum mechanics. Another basic idea is well, how did What's the mathematical formulation of quantum mechanics? The mathematical formulation of quantum mechanics is in terms of linear algebra. And um, so what you have is a, these cues that I've been talking about, uh, let us say they're coordinate operators, then you would say that a, a state This state is an eigenstate, well, the, the observables in quantum mechanics are represented by Hermitian matrices. And the Hermitian matrices have eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And um, if it were so that P and Q commuted, then um, you could follow this relation by PQ, Q prime, and you get Q prime, P, Q prime, and this state conceivably could have an eigenvalue P prime. And so this would be Q prime, P prime, Q prime. But in that case, um, you could rewrite this whole thing as being P prime on this state and first Q, and you'd be getting the same number, Q prime, three prime. But then the difference between these two would be zero, at least when acting on this state. And the fact that it's not zero is this commutation relation of quantum mechanics. So, So, I, mean, I 
don't know how much more to say about quantum mechanics. Let's put it this way. Don't worry that you don't have, haven't had a course in quantum mechanics. Um, anyway, the fundamental rules of quantum mechanics are these three equations, in which, um, which are all, in, you can think of Q and P as matrices, um, or you can think of them as linear operators. But the point is that you can measure the coordinates of two different things to arbitrary precision simultaneously. You can measure the momenta of two different things to arbitrary precision simultaneously. But you can't measure the position and the momentum of the same thing. Delta ij is 1 if i is j. Delta ij is 0 if i is not equal to j. And um, so if i and j are the same, then you're talking about measuring the position and the momentum of the same thing. And in that case, um, they don't commute. And the, the, uh, the, uh, the magnitude of their lack of commutivity is proportional to Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. That's what the slash means. It's a silly notation, but it's um, become, well, it became standard before I was born. And that was a long time ago. Um, OK, so let me get back to, let me just take these things as uh, magic relations, if you haven't had a course in quantum mechanics. Let's put these fundamental variables this means that we have n positions and n momenta. And if we had, for example, n particles, or m particles, then n would be 3m. There would be 3m three, three coordinates and 3m momenta. And so these would be the phase space variables considered as operators. And we put them in the vector v. Now, the commutation relations here of VI with VJ, well, they're actually IH bar times something I'm going to call JIJ. And J is a matrix zero identity minus identity zero. So J is 2n by 2n. I is the n by n identity matrix, and then this is minus i. And you can see that this works because if, if i and j are between 1 and n, then these are both q's and they commute. If i and j are both bigger than n, then they're both p's and then they commute. But if it's i with j and i is smaller than j, then you're up here. In other words, if i is one of the q's and j is one of the p's, then you're here and, uh, and you get 1. And this, because this is the identity, that gives you the delta ij part. In other words, this is non-zero only when i and j are the same. And the same thing down there. OK, so now what um, if we want v prime i v prime j to be the same, where v prime i is, here I, I need, um, suppose that we go from v prime, from b to v prime, and v prime i is r i j v j summed j equals, well, let's make this L. L equals 1 to 2n. So R is a 2n by 2n matrix. Then this thing here is a sum, R I L V L, and this one is a sum, R, let's make this a, all right, we can make this a j. R, J, K, V, K. 
and now we have the commutator of those two. Well, the commutator is this thing. In other words, it's I h bar a sum, and now it would be I R I L um, I h bar J L K, and then R J K. Okay, so it, and we want this to be the same thing as vi vj because we want the commutation relations to be the same. But vi vj is this thing i h bar j i j, and so the rule is that r has to satisfy a certain relation, and the relation is r j r transpose equals j. Well, this is the defining relation for SP2N. So this is all real 2N by 2N symplectic matrices. So, in other words, the symplectic group is defined as all 2n by 2n matrices that are real that leave this leave j invariant when you act on them like this. So again, it leaves something invariant. That's the way the group works. And um, amazingly enough, the symplectic group um, is the group that uh, leaves the commutation relations of quantum mechanics invariant. Um, now there are all sorts of other examples. Um, what, what I've just gone through with the orthogonal groups and the unitary groups and now the symplectic groups, these are um, the compact groups. And, well, there are a few other complex groups, but they're all called exceptional. Um, and. Uh, there are only about five exceptional groups. And I'm not going to discuss the exceptional groups, at least certainly not today. Um, but these are all of the, of the compact groups. And you see the compact groups, again, when you represent them by matrices, as you let the, as you look at the matrix and imagine the matrix running over all the matrices in the group, all possible matrices in the group, the um, matrix elements remain uh, bounded. Those are the compact groups. Now, non-compact groups, wh what are some examples? Well, translations in n space. So in other words, um, FedEx moves things around on the surface of planet Earth, and um, well, actually, now that I think about it, that would be a compact group because planet Earth is surface of planet Earth is finite, and the operations of FedEx are effectively rotations about the center of the Earth. But um, if you think of translations in free space, then um, I guess we're talking about NASA or um, Elon Musk's uh, activities, um, where you can go into arbitrarily, or I mean, you know, just take a flashlight and shine it up into the sky. The photons go on forever, and um, uh, so the, the the translations, however, do leave something invariant, namely. The distance between two points distance between two points is left invariant. So in other words, if you translate everything to the right by one mile, um, then uh, 
In other words, if you change, if you translated this piece of chalk by one mile in that direction, the distance between one end of the chalk and the other end of the chalk would remain invariant. Um, other other um, examples are the. Or let me let me write it differently. R vector squared minus c squared t squared. This is this is the the Lorentz distance or the Minkowski distance of a point position r time t from the origin zero zero. Um, and um, so what leaves this invariant? What leaves this invariant are Lorentz transformations. So, um, and these of course are four by four matrices that change, uh, mix up R and T. And they leave R squared minus C squared T squared invariant, C being uh, the speed of light. And um, the next thing, though, you can think about is what leaves R minus R one minus R two squared minus C squared T one minus T two squared invariant. In other words, what leaves the Minkowski distance between two points invariant? Well, these four Poincaré transformations. And they are combinations of Lorentz transformations and translations in four space. In other words, translation to three space and a translation in time is you just wait and time goes by. Okay, these groups are all non-compact and um, they're also all continuous groups. And um, there are other groups, though. Um, and for, for example, the biggest group of matrices that I know of is GLNC. So this is all n by n complex matrices, period. G means general linear. So each matrix is a linear transformation. So then you can have SL and C. So these are these guys, but of determinant one. And um, then you can say, well, you don't want the matrices to have complex, you don't want complex matrices, you want real matrices, in which case you replace C by R, and then you have GLNR, SLNR. All right, those are basically, that's basically it for definition of a group, examples of group. In fact, what I've, what I've given you there is um, essentially all, um, all the groups, apart from these exceptional groups, which, as I said, are, well, they're exceptional, they're only a, uh, there are only, I think, five of them. E8 is the biggest. And is that the same E8 as? Huh? Is that the same uh, string theory E8? Yeah. Okay. I mean, not that I have worked on string theory E8, but there's only one E8. Okay. okay. Um, now, a really important thing in, in physics and in group theory is uh, representations of groups. So let's see, there haven't been very many questions lately. Would you like to take a minute and show us um, the Lorentz transformation explicitly? Ah. That's, uh, that's, let's see, right off the top of my head, um, 
the important thing is to well let's see there are certainly ones in my book can I grab my book and In fact, uh, the, the place that I remember talking about is in, uh, in chapter uh, 11. Um, okay, here, um, here's an example. Suppose we let the matrix be gamma, square root of gamma squared minus 1, 0, 0, square root of gamma squared minus 1, gamma, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. Okay, now, what? What would this do? This this um, matrix this is T prime, X prime, Y prime, Z prime, and over here we would have T X Y Z. Um, and gamma is just some real number uh, greater or equal to zero and um, let's see, is it even possible for it to be zero? Um, oh no, we don't want it to be zero. Uh, it's, it's in fact greater than or equal to one because we have gamma squared minus one, and we don't want things to be imaginary. So this changes time into gamma time plus the square root of that times x, and then it changes x into x prime, which is t times gamma squared minus one plus gamma times x. And, um, so let's see, why is this a Lorentz transformation? Well, what we want is x prime squared. And I should say that in this, I've left out, I should have had a c here. So let's just set c equal to 1 for the moment and um, to make this simple. So that's, what is this? Well x prime is going to be square root of gamma squared minus 1 times t plus gamma times x squared, right? To, I mean, you, you need to watch me like a hawk when um, I'm doing things without my notes, okay? Now what's t prime? Well t prime is gamma t plus square root of gamma squared minus one x squared. Okay, so what's that? Well that's going to be gamma squared minus one times t squared uh, minus gamma squared times t squared, doing those two terms. And then it's going to be gamma squared x squared minus gamma squared minus 1 x squared. And I didn't like that because I foolishly thought that the cross terms would cancel, but they, I'm going to have to write them down. Um, this is plus 2 gamma square root of, oh, they will cancel, gamma squared minus 1 from this term minus 2 gamma square root of gamma squared minus 1 x t 
speed. Okay, so you can see that these gamma squared terms cancel, and in the top, we're just left with uh, x squared minus minus 1 times x squared minus t squared, and these terms cancel. So x prime squared minus t prime squared is equal to x squared minus t squared. And if, if we put c back in, then we have c squared here and c squared there. So this is an example of a 4 by 4 matrix that, um, that uh, preserves um, the Minkowski distance of um, a point from the origin. <coughs> and it's uh, a Lorentz transformation. Um, one, one effect of, one thing that Einstein pointed out well, a long time ago, um, more than 100 years ago, was that um, if an object is moving very fast, it um, ages more slowly. And in fact, uh, there's a, um, a uh, nice demonstration of that that can even be done in a, in a, in a lab experiment or a demonstration. Namely, <coughs> you can have something that observed that, that um, de de detects muons. Well, you have cosmic rays hitting the upper atmosphere. These cosmic rays uh, collide with nuclei in the atmosphere, nitrogen and oxygen nuclei and produce pions. The pions decay very quickly into muons and neutrinos. Some of the muons come to Earth. Now, if all this happens up at 10 kilometers or higher in the sky, and these muons wouldn't get down to Earth, or very few of them would get down to Earth, um, if it weren't for the fact that they age more slowly because they're moving so fast. And um, um, of course, also they wouldn't. I mean, they get down to Earth quicker because they're moving fast. But um, even the fact, if they were aging at the same rate, even though they're moving fast, um, they'd all have decayed into electrons and neutrinos by the time they got to the surface. Um, okay, so representations. Uh, let's see, you get a candy hole because you asked a question, a um, particularly difficult question. Um, so I wanted to say, what's a representation of a group? Well, you notice that all the description I've given, almost all of it, has been in terms of matrices. And so a representation of a group is just um, a map between, let's say, G is the group, and little g is an element of the group. It's a map to a matrix D of G. These matrices are often called D because the language of science was German until 1945. And um, so this was Darstellung, um, was a uh, German word for representation. Anyway, so this is a matrix depending on G. And uh, it's, it forms a representation if, suppose G1 times G2 is G3, then what you must have is that D of G1 times D of G2 is equal to D of G3. So this means that these matrices, these matrices have a multi matrix multiplication law that mimics the group multiplication law, and that's called a representation. And um, so you see, I've defined, apart from this abstract talk about groups and transformations, 
I've defined ON as the group of all n by n matrices. So right there, I've defined the matrix, the group, in terms of the represent, in terms of the, so to speak, defining representation of the group, n by n matrices that do that. Do that. And um, UN is n by n matrices that are unitary, which is, um, <coughs> Uh, I wrote it this way, but it's also U dagger U is the identity matrix. That's the unitary matrix. Um, so these are representation. So that's the idea of a representation. And um, in the book there, I mention what the representations are for SU two and SO three actually. Um, if you have a particular rotation about a, a particular axis, um, then uh, I don't know if I should really write down those. I can just sort of show you them to you. Um, they're two by two. Uh, in fact, this is actually a, a, a nice way of writing the thing. E to the minus i beta dot sigma. That's one. That's one way of writing down the two by two representation, the SU two element for rotation about the axis theta vector and the magnitude of the rotation. The number of radians is the length of the vector theta, and um, sigma are the Pauli matrices. And, um, well, maybe I should use this board over here. The Pauli matrices are uh, sigma 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, sigma 2, 0 minus i, i, 0, sigma 3, 1, 0, 0 minus 1. Um, And uh, so you can imagine forming an exponential if e to the minus i theta vector dot sigma, where sigma is a vector of three two by two matrices, and then you divide by two, and uh, that matrix then represents a rotation about the axis theta. Was there a question? Uh, well, can I say something about? Groups for a minute. Look, I've seen groups before, and something that confused me a lot for anybody this first time they're seeing it. The first couple times I saw this, I thought of groups as matrices, but the groups, or the elements in the group themselves, are not necessarily matrices. Right. The, the idea is you have an abstract group, and you know, mathematicians are very pure. They're not pure, I'm being pure, but the mathematicians are pure. And they um, they think of the group as abstract, and uh, the matrices are a way of representing a group. It was just something that confused me before, and I, I didn't know if anybody was seeing this for the first time that the little g could be position, or it could be momentum, or it could be a state vector, it, whereas the capital D of g is a matrix representation of that object. Well said. It's, it's, it's really confusing for me the first time I saw it because I'm just going, yeah. what are these D's, what are these G's? Thank you. All right, let me now say um, something uh, very simple about representations. Um, namely, if you have one, representation, you can make another one very easily. For example, if suppose D of G is a representation in terms of n by n matrices. Suppose S is an n by n matrix with an inverse. So this S, S times S inverse is the identity matrix. Then, 
you can have a new representation. d prime of g is equal to s d of g s inverse. So this is called an equivalent representation. And um, this transformation here that is taking us from the matrix D of G to the matrix D prime of G by multiplying D of G from the left by S and from the right by S inverse, this is called a similarity transformation. Okay, so now, obviously, there are infinitely many n by n matrices that uh, have inverses. In fact, every n, n by n matrix whose determinant is not zero has an inverse. So for every representation of every group, every n by every, for every n by n representation of every group, and every n by n matrix that, whose determinant is non-zero, you have yet another representation. You have a map from one representation to another. So representations um, are, um, are not unique at all. And, um, and so what people do is uh, they decide that they're going to work with one representation and not screw around with all of them. So you pick one representation and you stay with that representation. Um, oh, I, I left out the main thing. I didn't show you why this is a representation, why d prime is a representation. And so let me do that. You see d prime, of, let's do d prime of g times d prime of g prime. Well, this will be s d of g s inverse times s d of g prime s inverse, okay? But now s s inverse is 1, so this is s d of g d of g prime s inverse, but then since d is a representation This is S D of G G prime as inverse. And that is by definition D prime of G G prime. Okay, so in other words, D prime of G times D prime of G prime is the product of these two things. These give you the identity, so you've got that. Because D is a representation, D of D, G, D of G times D of G prime is D of G, G prime. And then the similarity transformations takes you to D prime of G, G prime. So that's why, it's a, that's why similarity transformations lead to new representations of the group, and these are called equivalent representations. And typically one sticks with... Um, one uh, representation just is, is no point in talking about a lot of them. Now, if you have a, some, an n by n representation of some group, you might be able to find a similarity transformation such that SD, S inverse looks like this. In other words, it's some D1 0, 0, D2, 0, 0, 0, 0, D3. In other words, it is block diagonal. This is block diagonal form. And um, what you say then is that the original representation was reducible. Reducible to something simpler a block diagonal form there. And 
clearly, uh, if, if, if you can't do that, then you say the representation is irreducible. And normally, um, the way mathematicians think of this, they think if you take any arbitrary representation, you then find a similarity transformation that takes you to block diagonal form where all of these no longer can be split up into more into finer block diagonal forms. In other words, each of these is then irreducible. And the, the mathematical abbreviation for that is IRREP, irreducible representation. So so that's basically the, uh, how representations go. Now, um, one more thing about representations. Um, this is, has to do with quantum mechanics, and this was something that was shown by Wigner back in the 30s and um, sharpened somewhat by Weinberg um, more recently. Um, and it's that, well, first of all, let, let me define a, are we done with this? Can I flip this over? Or you, The idea is that it takes states, so in quantum mechanics, um, suppose we know, suppose we measure all the properties that we can measure simultaneously about uh, of a system, we measure them all, that's, that's called a state. Let me give an example. So suppose you've got electrons. And suppose you arrange for the electrons to be moving in a particular direction at a particular speed. Now, electrons also have spin. Suppose you were, that is to say, they, they're, actually, we don't understand spin at all. It's an embarrassing truth that we all agree to pretend that we pretend, we just don't talk about the fact that we don't understand spin. Anyway, um, I mean, we can represent it mathematically in terms of group theory, but um, what it is, um, so the electrons have angular momentum, h bar over two, and we could arrange for all the electrons to have spin up, say, or to have, to be, to have spin h bar over two in the direction they're moving. That's called the positive velocity. All right, so imagine then we have all the electrons moving in a precise direction at a precise speed and with the angular momentum in the same direction. We call, we'd say all of those electrons are in the same state. Well, that's how we think of states in quantum mechanics. Another example, we might have a gas of hydrogen atoms. And um, if we wait long enough and keep the let the hydrogen gas really cool, then all the atoms will be in their electronic ground states. And even that's a little tricky because um, due to the spin of the proton and the spin of the electron, there's a, an interaction between their magnetic moments that makes things a little bit even more tricky. But eventually they'd all be in the same state, the ground state. Of course, they'd also be moving in different directions in the bottle, and um, 
So if you really wanted it to be a state, then you'd um, let them come out of the bottle and select out the ones that are moving in the same direction at the same speed and so forth. Anyway, you get eventually down to a state. So that, that's what we mean by state in quantum mechanics. And a symmetry is a transformation from once from any state to another state such that the problem, such that the uh, well, it's actually more complicated than that. Let me. What we talk about in quantum mechanics is probabilities, and what are probabilities? Well, the probability that psi. Suppose you have a system in the state's psi. And you ask, well, what's the probability that it um, that if you measure it, you find it's in some other state phi? And um, you might say, boy, that's that's crazy. The way you you just defined state, if the electrons are moving with spin that way in uh, a certain direction. Well, that's the way the spin is. But in fact, if you measure the spin of the uh, electron, if you measure it in the direction of motion, then all the electrons in the state that I just defined as being all having the spin in the, that direction, they'd all be measured to be have the spin in that direction. But suppose you don't measure that. Suppose you measure what the spin is of the electron in the up direction. Suppose the things are moving horizontally, and you measure the spin in the up direction. Well, it turns out that the value you get is half of them would be, you'd say half of them would be spin up and half of them would be spin down. And um, so that's why. Uh, that's because you're measuring something that isn't precisely specified by the state. I hope I'm not confusing everybody. And we're all going to drop the cost tonight. Um, all right, anyway, the, so this is, you notice the square. The, the, this thing is called an inner product of the state psi with the state phi. That's a complex number. You take the absolute value squared, that's a probability. That's the probability that if you have a system in one state, you measure it in another state. You have a system in this state, you measure it, you find it to be in that state. Well, if you have a map psi to psi prime, phi to phi prime, and this is the same And this is called a symmetry. So now we have this map that's a symmetry that respects these, that, such that you have the same probabilities. What is it that Figner and Weinberg showed? They showed that the state psi prime is either a unitary transformation of psi, and phi prime is a unitary transformation of phi, or, and this is the weird case, the weird case is that, that psi to psi prime and phi to phi prime is some matrix K that's anti-unitary and anti-linear. So here, by saying, by writing U here, I'm sort of essentially saying that this is a linear transformation. That is to say, um, U on uh, a vector Z A plus W B is Z U on A plus W, U on B 
So this is linear. And most symmetries are linear. Some symmetries, really spooky ones, are anti-linear and anti-unitary. Time reversal is one of them. And um, frankly, I'm confused every time I think about time reversal. I just change the subject when it comes to problems. All right, well, we're at the end of the hour. Um, remember, um, I went to Costco in the last few days to get the fresh box of um, fruity snacks um, in order to encourage you to ask questions. And the questions are serve three purposes. One is to interrupt me, to prevent me from just reading the book. Secondly, to clarify something for yourself and for probably the person sitting next to you or sitting behind you. And um, thirdly, to keep the course appropriate to the students, because um, I, I mean, I, I'm aware of the fact that partly because I didn't want to just read the book, um, I've gone off on many, many tangents, and these tangents sometimes have taken us to. Uh, to quantum mechanics and to other areas that um, are more advanced and hard to explain. Um, uh, are there any questions before we uh, end this session? Okay. All right. So um, what you might do, though, is make friends with each other so that you find a partner to do a project with. But you can do a project by yourself. And as I say, the, the, grading, the grading system is kind of, it's so loose that you don't really need to do a project. You know, you're having a name on this. Uh, what? Say it again. Syllabus. Well, it's basically the second half of the book. But, um, you know, I'm not going to, I mean, there are some topics that do get complicated and sophisticated. I'm going to speak that a little more, especially if they're not. But it's essentially the second half of the book. But the parts of it that the student wants, and apparently what you guys want so far is three things. Um, group theory, tenses, and GR and cosmology, and then uh, some AI. So that's, that's what I'm going to focus on to begin with. Oh, sorry. All right, we're going to turn this off. So you just push that red button again. Okay.